for the uh, yeah so it's recording we are now officially recorded good so, I, I am also recording i, I started recording from my side as well julian <laughs> so, excellent so perfect uh i'll go through the policy reading as usual guys uh, as we are used to do this Linux Foundation Antitrust Policy. Linux Foundation meetings involve participation by industry competitors and is the intention of the Linux Foundation to conduct all of its activities in accordance with the applicable antitrust and competition laws. It is therefore extremely important that attendees adhere to meeting agendas and be aware of and not participate in any activities that are prohibited under applicable US state, federal, or foreign antitrust and competition laws. Examples of types of actions that are prohibited at Linux Foundation meetings and in connection with Linux Foundation activities are described in Linux Foundation and trust policy. If you have questions about these matters, please contact your company council, or if you are a member of the Linux Foundation, feel free to contact Andrew up the Grove of the firm of Gastner of the Grove LLP, which provides legal counsel to the Linux Foundation. Hyperledger is committed to creating a safe and welcoming community for all. For more information, please visit our Hyperledger conduct, code of conduct. So, perfect. Here we are. Uh, we start the meeting, and it's my pleasure to welcome this morning. Actually, even if for him, you know, it's on the other side of the world. Exactly, we are the opposite. Brandon McDonald from Trade Window. Uh, it's great honor for me to welcome the very first speech by guy from Aotearoa. <laughs> so I'll leave it unto you, Brandon, to have this presentation that we will agree great. on. And great to have you here today. Yeah, great to be here as well. I'm looking forward to uh, taking everybody through what we're going to talk about today, which is international trade, future self, and the digital twin. <laughs> So what we're going to cover off is I'm going to do a little bit of an introduction into uh, myself, Trade Window, what a future self is. We'll cover off uh, digital twins, some of the barriers that we need to overcome to achieve this, thinking differently, the trade twin, uh, technology enablement, and future self digital twins. And then, we'll, then there's uh, an opportunity for some Q&A. So a little bit about myself, I'm Brendan McEnroe and I'm the CTO at Trade Window. I'm down here in uh, New Zealand that some people sometimes forget to put on the map, uh, but we are down here in the Southern Hemisphere. And I've got 30 years uh, technology uh, industry experience, real passionate uh, technologist, team builder, but also a norm changer. And this is a picture of our team that we've got down here at Trade Window. So I'll tell you a little bit about Trade Window before we jump into uh, talking about uh, digital twins. So we were, we were a startup, we were founded back in December 2008, and we've got 70 FTEs across New Zealand, Australia, and Singapore. We've got a growing customer base of over 500 uh, leading exporters and freight forwarders uh, from, um, from New Zealand and growing in Australia. We've got the backing. Uh, from ASB, that was part of their innovation. They uh, seed funded us. And then we've had a number of other significant investors like Keyside Holdings. We're one of the very few uh, non-bank uh, SWIFT registered companies. So we've got our own bit code and that allows us to listen in on the, on the SWIFT network. And we're part of the Pan-Asia e-commerce alliance we represent New Zealand and Australia in the uh, PAA. We, we went right from the early days, um, did the ISO uh, 9001 and 27001, really setting us up for kind of success in that from the outset. And our purpose is really about defining uh, uh, trade across uh, global supply trains. I'm really connecting all the parties and really delivering that trust and seamless end-to-end -end digital trade. 
So we we do about 34 billion total value of export goods through our platform, um, about 160 plus economies, uh, 130,000 sets of shipping documents every year, and which is which equates to about a million export documents that we generate per year. Really focusing on um, uh, New Zealand's primary uh, industries around produce, meat, timber, uh, uh, dairy, seafood, um, growing into Australia and Asia Pac. So we like to think of ourselves as the trade super connector. Um, and that's a real verifiable source of data and documents. And yes, we have built on the, the Hyperledger platform. So we do operate decentralized nodes, which includes Hyperledger and also some decentralized storage. Um, through them nodes uh, allows us to um, share uh, data documents and, and really bring that trust. And, and we're not just interested in necessarily operating our own nodes. Um, we will have, uh, we're building out more nodes across various different uh, jurisdictions to, to create that, that trust in the platform that we operate. And we've done, we've got a connect platform which allows interoperability with other networks. And that can be public chains, done some work with Trade Trust or some other private blockchains like with the likes of TradeVan. So through our product at Cube that sits on top of all this, we've got various different trade documents that we exchange, uh, data, we've got finance products and data acquisition products integrating with the likes of New Zealand Customs, International Customs through partners, uh, freight forwarders, exporters, and importers, and bringing them all together through the end-to-end -end seamless trade. So that's really kind of brief overview of what Trade Window is. But let's look at what we've come here for today. And that's this is some of my observations and thoughts. There's a world of opportunity before us in international trade. So this is just some thoughts around what we're seeing and what some of the opportunities are. So one thought I'd like to put there is future self. What do we want to be within international trade? So if we take Dr. Gilbert, I don't know if any of you have actually seen this uh, TED, sh uh, Ted uh, show. Um, this is Dr. Daniel G Gilbert explains the bias that we've got about ourselves and our future selves, our possible selves. And it's not somebody that we discover, but somebody that we decide to be. So this is, we start telling people what we want to be. So future self, we tend to think that with a person today is always gonna be the person that we're always gonna be. And future selves, looking at them possible selves can serve as a roadmap to really guide us as individuals of where we want to be in the, in, the, in the future. And that's really important, kind of taking this and then reflecting on this and what does that mean to us as what our future self is from a trade perspective. So future self of trade, we don't have to be defined by what we do now. We can really start to engage and deliberate practice uh, over time, so we grow into what we, we want to be in that ever evolving story. And we take action and we invest in building our future identity. So, if we think what we want to be as trade in our future self is connected, interoperable, actionable, predictive, and trusted. And to be able to do that, we've got to think forward, we've got to create the stepping stones. We've got to think about what that roadmap look, looks like and what are the steps to then take us to our future self. So one of them future selves is a digital twin. And we've seen the emergence of digital representation of these within inside the, the physical world. So let's just have a look at where the kind of the birth of the twins has come from. So way back in 1970, the NASA Apollo 13 represented um, 
they had means to be able to represent the data around the, the Apollo 13. Then we start to see in the Mirror Worlds book when they first start uh, envisaging the concept of, of digital twins. And then 2002, we see uh, Michael Greaves then start to really apply the concept of digital twins to the product lifecycle management. And in 2010, John Vickers of NASA then really coined the phrase of digital twin. And 2019 is when Gartner then reveals digital twins are entering the mainstream use in organizations. So let's have a look at the digital twin hype cycle. So 2017, it started to enter the innovation trigger uh, on, the, on the Gartner hype cycle. 2018, it entered the inflated expectations. 2019, Gartner started to say that it was entering mainstream use with inside organizations. But 2020, we then start to see new innovation triggers appearing for digital twins. And this was around the person and the citizen. And we're already starting to see some of this in use in smart cities. 2022, Gartner expects that 85% 80, of all IoT platforms will then start to include some form of digital twin monitoring. But 2013 is when we could see the emergence of a trade twin into that innovation trigger. So what are the characteristics of a digital twin? Well, it's about connectivity, homogenization, it's smart, it's got traces, and it's modular. What does that really mean? So connectivity, it's about uh, connecting the physical to the digital. It's about connecting organizations. It's about connecting parties to one another, but it's also about connectivity between digital twins. The, the homogenization is that virtual representation of that physical world, creating that data similar. And smart, being able to remotely adjust, self-adjust and have acts around it. And traces, leaving that historical digital data, having that audit trait that can prove what actions were taken around it. And it's modular, it has design, and it allows customization. So that, that's the characteristics of a digital twin, but what's the use that we've seen today? Seen the day, we've seen the use with inside manufacturing, we've seen it in predictive maintenance and uh, aerospace, and, and starting to see emergence with inside connected vehicles and healthcare. It's been great interest around the customer, the citizen, smart cities, but beyond the manufacturing process, the supply chain has really kind of lagged behind. It's focused on IoT and logistics and so much more opportunity. Now we can use digital twins in what we need in the problems that we've got before us. So what we've seen today is focus very heavily on the, on the physical world. The physical world of applications, IoT, providing that monitoring, feedback and predictive and, and recording the effects with inside the, the physical world. And that just kind of supports what we're seeing around people describing IoT and IoT devices on containers as, as, uh, uh, as digital twins. So what we've got at the moment is a very kind of closed ecosystem. It's limited to certain business process it's very application focused and it's lacking open standards. And we've got very little synchronization between parties and no relationship, no relationships between twins themselves. So what barriers do we need to overcome in trade and digitization? There's a lot of legal and standards frameworks. So let's just look at what's going on. And this is an example around uh, Asia Park of what's happening around model law. 
this the ratification of, of uh, multiple been... sorry so so the ratification of the model law so we, here we can see i think there was an echo brandon sorry oh, okay Everybody mute please okay no problem so legal is uh, uh, um, a, a block for us at the moment we can see uh, singapore is really kind of leading the way around ensuring the electronic commerce electronic signatures and electronic transferable records there's a, a number of initiatives going on to ratify uh, model law around the world uh, to, and this is this is an app this is the big rock this is the big rock without this we can have wonderful technology but without this being unblocked then we're going to be um, uh, we're going to be uh, locked into not being able to truly to take advantage of uh, uh, transferable records but the the great thing of kind of covid that's come out of this is that it's really kind of driven initiatives to address electronic transferable records. So legal ratification, we've seen Singapore and they're really leading the charge on model law. The G7 with the uh, digital technology track Annex 4, uh, bringing in the, the various uh, countries, Canada, France, Germany, UK, US, et cetera, around that. And, and the United Nations model law on electronic transferable records, the UK Law Society is a, a, a pushing for um, adoption. So to really kind of um, um, help with the with digital is having that adoption of legal frameworks. And here in New Zealand, we're doing what we can here with with government to uh, inform them around what needs to happen to unblock this. Data standards are really lagging as well. Um, the different technology regulations across the jurisdictions. Um, this is from the World Economic Forum. Um, fragmented markets, um, higher uh, uh, capital requirements, as the complexity of uh, technology is intensifying. So standards are key enabler. So we need to think differently about our future self. And digital versions of the paper that we've got today are not the only pathway. So we take, let's take bill of lading as one example. It's used for that freight receipt of freight services, contract between the carrier and shipper, document of title, all the legal binding, invoicing, and finance that's associated with that. There's problems. It's paper, there's fraud, there's admin costs, there's practical issues. We all know the, the, the problems around this. And the DCSA are saying less than 0.1% are issued electronically. But taking what we've got today in paper and just doing a digital representation, that is not a digital twin. So eBill is a step forward, but it's not the future self. So what are some of the options? Well, trade twin, taking that digital twin concept and applying it to trade. So we think about entities and objects and not paper. So we don't think about an EBO and trying to reproduce that with inside a digital form. We think about the objects with inside trade that are needed. So that could be the shipment, it could be the container. Within each of these, there's various different aspects that are needed. They need to be interoperable. They need to be identity associated with that, 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 um, that digital twin. Actions can be taken around it and it can be connected. There's orchestration that needs to uh, happen on that. And the data needs to be verifiable. And as that twin is interacted with, there needs to be an audit trail and it needs to be permissioned. There's only some, so much information that would need to be uh, uh, exposed to the various different parties. But if you think of the objects of trade that we have today around the shipment, around the vessel, around the goods, this is the, these, these are the objects we should be looking and seeking to uh, define rather than just digitization of paper. 
We've got the technology in our toolbox. We've got APIs, we've got blockchain, we've got tokenization capabilities and decentralized storage. And we can start to define interoperable uh, standards and we've got cryptography. So let's just look at a few examples of what they could be. If we take something like finance, the bank, the bank needs to see certain information to be able to validate the data, ensure there's no fraud detection around that, do their AML, KYC, and approve that. But for that, they need to know things like the identity, the data. It's not necessarily about just that they've got an invoice, the bill of lading, and, and other documents around, around trade. They want to know the parties and the relationships around that and the terms that they've agreed to. Insurance similarly wants to know who has done what, what are the jurisdiction of the goods at any point in time. If we take, if we take two businesses, the importer and the exporter, they could have a relationship with the digital twin for the goods. And that's got an agreement, which is some deeds of them particular parties. It's context-based now, and you can have some execution and payments associated with that. We've got containers. They're in an environment, so there's environment. That, yes, that's the traditional um, IoT kind of information, but we can also really understand, understand that container, the environment it's in, the movement that it's gone through, any releases or demand forecasting. Take logistics. There's, again, there's events, there's release, there's packaging, there's warehouse, and who's, who's under whose jurisdiction are then goods. So as you can see, there's, there's a whole kind of different objects of information that are needed that will drive workflow, that data needs to be shared, that has an identity, but has monitoring in that we can, we, we can have access to work, what's happening in the real world around that digital twin, but also importantly, being able to control that and drive the workflow. So here's a trade twin maturity model I've put together. And we start down at level zero. And that's really just taking the paper that we've got at the moment and turning that into a model representation. So we're taking the certificate of origin, the commercial invoice, the packing list, the bill of lading, and representing it in a model. Then we start to turn it into an object virtualization. So that's then thinking of the goods, the container, an object description. It's localized and it's still linked back to that, uh, that, uh, that paper. Then we start to build out canonical models. We've got a shared model, ontology, taxonomy. We've got validation against that now. We can now start to do uh, data exchange got the activity and history that are being performed on, on that uh, trade twin. Then we look at integrating. How do we exchange the information? How do we add digital identity, signing and tokenization, hashing of information so that trust, legal, finance can now start to operate on it. And the hashing will, allows so that full disclosure of the information in, in, in the twin don't, doesn't have to be made. So validation of whether uh, an invoice has been presented before by just using hashing of certain information around that allows that to, to be checked without full knowledge of what's in the, the um, invoice. Then we can start to analyze. We've got the historical data, being able to report on that and incorporating uh, IoT into, into that trade twin. Then it's all about connecting. Twin to twin, we've got the different objects and then building relationships and dependencies and uh, orchestration between them. Open APIs. And this is where the, the inter-blockchain really starts to come to its own. We've got shared events and we've got relationship dids, which uh, uh, allow, and we'll, we'll cover this off uh, later on, strengthening uh, some of that, that identity. Then we start to move to predicting. And this is because the twin is operating in the real world, it's starting to then um, understand what the future events could be. 
and the changes that are happening in the real world and what that future flow could look like. So then level seven, it starts to use machine learning to then start to prescribe what action should be taken, remedial actions. Uh, there could be a delay or a, a finance contract is, is uh, um, an, an issue. And, it, and it's then assisting the decisions to the human in, in what remedial action should be taken. The nirvana of getting to level eight is when we then start to make these twins autonomous. They include decisioning and the twins are informing one another, but also taking remedial action themselves, almost like a trade twin cyborg. So technology enablement. We, we have quite a number of tools we just need to understand which ones we take out of the toolbox. So one of the big areas is trust of data and parties. Who, what is permissioned and audible, and through that decentralization of trust. So digital identity for us, there, it's not just a technology buzzword. It promises a complete restructuring of the current centralized physical and digital identity ecosystem into a decentralized and democratized architecture. So we all know about DITs, and here's, a, here's, a, here's, a, here's an example. We've got a web div. We can do high, high pledger in day. There's a sovereign network. But the digital identity is about the people, the organizations, the entities, and the data. Yes, we can do self-sovereign. We can have multiple sources, so that strengthens the identity that we're carrying. It's about the source, the action, and verification, and it's permissioned. And through that, we get the, the, the trust of the data and the parties. But beyond the data is the decentralization of trust. So the decentralization of trust, when we've got the, the, the digital twins and we've got data associated with them, we can then start to build trust through the relationships, through the actions that are being taken on the twins. And that's a lot more powerful than just the did in itself. Because you get the, the network effect of organizations, assets, and data. So if I'm an exporter and I've interacted with an importer using a freight forwarder, using the, this carrier of these transactions, every interaction is building out that decentralization of trust. So what are, the, what are the enablers? So to really achieve this technology, we've got the blockchain, we've got the DITs, we've got the decentralized storage, and we can do the chain to chain. We've got the cryptography. We need to start to establish the interoperability standards, describing the twins. There's some great stuff being done by the IMDA, We've got APIs, some really good uh, work being done by the DCSA, the uh, GS1, but starting to think around the standards and the shared canonical models. But the thing on the left, the policy and the legal, the model law, this is the real, without this uh, enabler and the signatures and the transferable records, then the other two are just not going to succeed. So, Three interlink enablers are what's really needed to supercharge the true twins. So to really shape our future and think back to what our future self is, and if we want to go down the path of trade twins, there's no winner takes all, it's about collaboration. We've got to find some adoption wins within inside the ecosystem. We've got to look for um, where, where we want to be, what are some of the stepping stones that we put in place to be able to achieve this? We can't wait, um, I, I can't wait for the slowest common denominator within uh, the ecosystem. Establish interoperability, the standards, importantly the legal, and we've got a good handle on some of the technology. This brings in some of the addresses some of the cybersecurity and trust trust identity. So really, future selves 
can serve as a roadmap to guide individuals from where they are at present to where they imagine being in the future. Back to what Dr. Gilbert said. So if we think about the trade twins, how can we create our future self where we can use a trade twin? So together, let's build our future self and that trade twin. I'd like to hand over if there's any questions. Thank you, Brandon. That was a very interesting presentation. So I will leave it on to the audience to give their share, to, to ask for questions. It's a good occasion. Hi, Brandon, it's Eugenio here. Oh. I, I, I just called my time because I'm raising my hand, so nobody. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I'm just, uh, I would like to share a few suggestions because I think your, your presentation, it's a kind of uh, uh, working through the future, no? Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, and so I, I tried to take a few notes during the, 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 your presentation and, uh, and I will share it with you and we can maybe use this as a starting conversation after and yeah. with all the audience here. Um, the, the first uh, the, and the, probably one of the most uh, uh, powerful picture you, you showed to us is uh, the slides where you may see all the different level into these, uh, let's say, global digitalization, digital trade adoption. Yeah. And um, my my consideration, and in your opinion, where are we now in this in this uh, in this pave uh, uh, in this pave forward? And in my opinion, we are around the level five to six, and we are moving to there. Uh, of course, it's not <laughs> just uh, it's just my consideration, and and of course, you may see different. Uh, status on different, uh, let's say, micro-regional areas of the world. Of course, uh, maybe Asia-Pacific different from uh, what may be in other, in other zone of, of the world. Uh, but that, that is just a start. And um, my second consideration is about the enablers. And um, I would like also to add uh, to, to, to your, to your uh, suggestion one different perspective, which is uh, more focusing on what uh, uh, cannot be so flexible. So the geography, I think we will have, uh, let's say in general terms, some global standards, which will be related more on, on the technology itself, on the software, like ISO, like yeah. I or others. And then we will have a local enablers, uh, which will be more focusing on let's say specific uh, regulation and uh, specific uh, um, uh, best practices, let's say, or common understanding, uh, which uh, uh, may be agreed at the macro regional level, like in Asia Pacific. And, uh, and, and, and leading to the, to the third point, I think this is in essence uh, what I believe uh, uh, the intent, what I'm believing, the intent of a, a project like the Pan Asian uh, e-commerce alliance, uh, because fr from trade perspective, we are seeing uh, national uh, trade windows adopting or testing DLT technology at national level yeah. and, uh, and for the trade. And so we will see, we will likely see uh, all these nations uh, merging together uh, under some common enablers to specific uh, uh, goals like enforcing um, regional e-commerce operations like you mentioned in the in the financial economy so yeah. this is just really a, a sharing a few questions but also consideration <laughs> for you no 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 it's, you. It's, it's a really good point so so on that kind of maturity yes if, if you look at if you look at certain isolated um aspects of, of trade that the, there's, as, as, as mentioned, the, there's the IoT on, uh, in tracking, and, and that's, considered, that's considered digital twin. But the, the, the kind of the, the real challenge um, to, to that is it's, it's, it is very, uh, very isolated. And it's not really around the, the, the object, 
so the object of of the container so it's just one of the data feeds into that which tells the environmental uh, aspects of that container but where has that container been and who's who's done what and um who's who's who can take the, the actions around that and i think that's really kind of a, a game changer in starting to to think of the real world and how we can interact with that through through the digital twin than just relying on exchanging documents or even digital versions of the documents we've got to move beyond that and yes it might be uh, looking at things in the future but you know to the to the point around future self is where do we want to be where do we want really want to be with this? So when we take the next step, when we take these stepping stones, is it truly taking us to that destination, or is it is it taking us off on a tangent with with a course that's then harder for us to then pull back on? So I, I think how do we start to adopt some of this? Is is looking some for some then really good kind of use cases that can kind of demonstrate the value. Um, say across the, the PAA members of uh, exchanging some of these these interactions with um, you know we don't we don't have to we don't have to boil the world we can um, we can uh, uh, pick off some some really some 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 kind of pointy um, uh, use cases um, around demonstrating this but yeah uh, it, it is it is finding them and and and, and Please, you think we're we're up at level five? I think we're probably a little bit lower down in in that maturity model, but it might be the particular use case you're looking at. Mm. Okay, uh, okay. I, I, I like sorry, Eugenia. I like what you said, um, Brendan. You know, it's especially regarding to the IoT, uh, it's good interaction between the real world and digital world. So it's, it's kind of new uh, to the world of trade, namely, you know, where uh, it's quite independent. Uh, from what happens in the real world. So it's, it's kind of creating an interaction between the two worlds, which yeah. sounds of a, a revolution for, for the industry. I mean, in my, in my vision, you know, yeah. you think about documentary credits, you see how independent. So taking data from the real world to an abstract world, which, you know, so, so close look, it's, it's a real deal. It's no real revolution. That yeah, might lead to having different products yeah. uh, side by side to the traditional one. That's, in my vision, the real revolution that we we're about to to bring on. Um, you know, I was talking to an event a little earlier. You know, during this month. I was, you know, uh, what DLTs are about to bring in the industry is a new way for stakeholders to interact between them. And that's real point, you know, uh, taking a linear approach into interaction between the stakeholders, we're, what we have to point out, you know, the real revolution is that. And we have to make clear, otherwise we, we come to, you know, results in the future. Yeah. Uh, uh, we have a few uh, questions, Brendan, for you in the, in the chat. And the very first is, what kind of increased business we can gain from digital twin? I think, you know, uh, maybe John Franco uh, wanted to point out that what are the advantages of going for digital twin? What, what are the advantages? Yeah. I, I mean, obviously, you know, like, like, yeah, so, so people think of, like always the IoT is the one because it's kind of simulating the, you, you see in the, the real world. But, you know, think around some of the, the data interactions that are around an object. And the, the, the benefits is, is being able to interact with that and have that, that one canonical model of that, but understanding all the interactions that have gone on all the interactions that are about to about to occur as well. So being able to share that really brings efficiencies around synchronization. When we look at some of the, the higher levels of maturity with inside the, the trade twin is, is starting to bring in some of that, that automation and uh, orchestration of, of other twins. So a good example might be 
we, we know that the, the goods are delayed. That, has a, that might have a, a knock-on effect to uh, logistics in the receiving company. It might also affect the finance around that. So the synchronization of the, the finance agreement uh, for, that, for that particular trade. So there's, as, as it starts to pan out, then you get the, the synchronization between, and you get the, it, it's, it, the, the efficiencies of, um, of, of, of the trust that when, when the events have, uh, have actually occurred. So I think it's a huge opportunity. Obviously, like I say, we don't want to kind of boil the world and it's just, just picking off some to really kind of demonstrate some good use cases. Brandon, uh, there are a few other questions, you know, oh, yeah. in chat. Uh, there is another one coming from Bankatesh Batney. What do you see trade trends in short term and long term time scales? <laughs> yeah, okay. Interesting. So we, we, we've already, here at Trade Window, we've already started on this journey. Um, so we've um, already started uh, preempting it <laughs> and, and started building digital twins, um, uh, which, which uh, include some of them early stages of, of that maturity model around uh, representing, you know, what does that model look like? What some of the uh, identity mechanisms, and and what what why why so what how can we kind of take that forward and share? I mean, particularly around PAA membership, uh, we want to we want to share some of the models that we've got there around these digital twins, so that we don't have to do point to point integrations with every other. Uh, window in in uh, Asia Pac, we can start to agree and 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 start to step through that maturity model together. So, short term, we're starting it. Um, longer term, uh, getting to that that nirvana of uh, level eight. Uh, I, I think that's a that's a good few years off. <laughs> but we've got to think about our future self. We've the, the industry does take a long time to kind of move. So we've got to start putting them stepping stones in place so we can we can get to that future self. It's, it's quite a long journey ahead. It is, it is, is but an, ex, a, an exciting one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, yeah, that's a challenge. I mean, when you have such a big challenge, you know, you, you, that's why you get the most of the satisfaction. You know, it's been a slow moving industry for centuries, if you think. So, you know, it's quite a challenge to move it forward. In a short period. There's a strategic question for you, Brandon. Are you planning to expand to India? Um, we, we'll, well, yeah, the, the answer is pretty, pretty easy uh, to be given. Yeah, so, so we work with uh, the PAA members and the PAA members in India as well. Um, uh, so that's, we, we see uh, to the point there's, there's no winner takes all, I think. Uh, connectivity and connecting with different parties in different jurisdictions is is how we all win together. Uh, so through PAA, we're building really strong relationships with each of the countries and uh, the, the parties there. Perfect. There was another question, um, Brandon, for you. Sorry. What are your thoughts on the African continental free trade area and digitization of trade? This is from Sam Ravid Mahailu. Uh, oh, no, I, I'm not mistaken in pronunciation. I'm, I'm sorry if I did. So, um, yeah, it's, I mean, I'd, I'd have to look at what the, the additional, what, the, what they're doing with inside their the, the African uh, free trade area and the digitization initiatives that they've got. Love to know more. Please connect with me and uh, let's understand what that means for, for Africa. Please reach out. Perfect. Uh, so one last question. No, no, two more questions. The first one, sorry, my computer is so slow this morning. Is the running member in Pakistan? Yeah, you know, it's pretty similar area. To India. Uh, I don't know whether the, I don't know whether the is as um, I don't know if it does include Pakistan. Okay. And again, uh, this is another question. There's another question, question about yeah. 
Jonathan Combs. Curious since BAA was mentioned so many times as a member of BAA for 10 years. I'm not sure whether BAA is the right forum test. Digital twins. I think many do not fully comprehend how BAA works. Yeah, I Jonathan here. Yeah. Hi, there, Jonathan. Hey, Jonathan. Hi, hi everyone. Good to hi, see your faces. Uh, put put some faces to uh to to the to the names. Uh, I am not presentable. <laughs> I'm, in, I'm in my pajamas, so I I shall not turn on my video. <laughs> I, I I I I I I'm thankful for for this uh presentation. I I got to learn more about digital twins and uh, concept of digital twins. I think it's very useful, uh, very interesting. Uh, very uh, futuristic, uh, but I I I am just curious because uh, I I I hear uh, PA mentioned so many times, I, and I understand uh, Trade Windows has just joined PAA, but uh, compared with PAA and other regional connectivity, for example, uh, you know the ASEAN ASEAN single window and other uh, regional. Uh, 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 Alliances and association. Uh, uh, for example, the ASEAN single window is uh, government led, uh, 10 countries government led. And then, of course, you have got the uh, RCEP uh, free trade agreements that has got uh, some digital, digital content. You also have got uh, now a digital uh, trade partnership, uh, Singapore with New Zealand, with Chile. Yeah. You know some of these new uh, 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 bilateral or uh, multilateral digital trade partnership. Maybe those mechanisms would be uh, useful for digital twin. Yeah. Uh, yeah. PAA, yeah. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Uh, absolutely, um, Jonathan. And yeah, I mean we've spoke about uh, PA uh, previously. We've had a few discussions uh, uh, between ourselves. Um, yeah. So look, it was. Let's let's explore what opportunities there. It doesn't have to be limited to Pierre, where where as a trade window, we're really kind of building out that relationship. But for this concept, for this digital trade uh, twin concept, yeah, it can go much uh, much further. Love to explore how um, other mechanism pathways that uh, it could be adopted. Thanks. Hmm. There's one more question, Brendan. What are the current challenges with technology solutions? And what is your suggestion to overcome them? Yeah. Um, I think the, the, the big one uh, and um, legal, there's the legals, uh, not technology blocker, but that is that is the big thing that needs to, needs to be addressed. But from a technology uh, point of view is identity. Identity is one of the key real uh, enables of this um, because we need identity of the data. We need identity of the organizations and the participants involved. So that decentralized identity and adoption of that is going to be uh, one, one, of, one of the key challenges to really get that uh, um, embraced because without that, it's going to make uh, the whole digital twin really, really hard because you you can't prove that uh, it was the action was taken by a particular party. Um, it's not verifiable. So I, I think the, the biggest challenge is that. One of the others is interoperability. Uh, obviously, the digital twin through that would want to start to define uh, the canonical models that could be used for that and the interactions and the activities that can be done against them. But when we talk about some of the technology that, that underpins it, so if we are representing these on blockchains um, and a decentralized storage for more heavyweight data that's needed, then we've got to start to think around how we do that blockchain to blockchain. Now, there is connectors between them. You can take an SDK from this, an SDK from that, and you can connect them. But one of the, one of the important things is, is being able to uh, transact the business process where you're not necessarily locking in between, between the two chains. So I think there's some, some patterns to kind of explore there beyond just uh, data exchange uh, between blockchain 
particularly where you're using um, uh, a token and ownership of, 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 that, of that token to be able to drive who should be taking the, the action with inside the, the process. So some really interesting things to, to kind of explore there. And I'm sure there'll be products that help us um, and our quant have been doing some stuff connecting uh, connecting blockchains together. I think we need a little bit more than just, just connecting to be able to support that business process. Thank you, Brandon. Is there any other question from the, the audience, from the attendants? It's a good occasion, you know, from having or having a perspective from so far away. <laughs> so I'll ask a question, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, so how do people? You, you, you said the future self, which is fantastic. I love that, yeah. Doctor Gilbert's yeah. uh, um, yeah. <laughs> philosophy or whatever you call it. So, how do people get involved? What's what's, what's the call to action if they want to get? Uh, uh, yeah, I, th I think it's it's a collective that we're going to have to do around this. It, it's not yeah. going to be be able to no one uh, individual or organization because to re for success of this. It is going to be interacting with um, uh, a number of different parties. As so, so I think, yeah, good question. How do we actually take this forward? How do we form something that could then start to establish what are really good use cases for the digital twin? Start to establish some of them uh, canonical models around that. So, yeah, and I'd like to explore and you know participate in how we could create a group around this. Okay, great. And any particular low hanging fruit? particular vertical industry area region that you think that would be oh, i'm going to say new zealand <laughs> of course <laughs> yeah um but i think uh it's it's going to rely on um the the model law so it's we we need that in place to be able to do uh did, to transfer the records digitally uh without that um, we're not going to be able to do it. So I think it's going to be looking to the countries that ratify that, obviously Singapore. So maybe New Zealand, Singapore will be a good one. Okay, cool. There's a good remark from Bob Lowe, uh, and I do thank him for doing this. Uh, he's saying, you know, pre-clearance must be the golden outcome. Data moves faster than ships. Tax and demurrage must be beneficiary. Uh, dear Bob, I can subscribe to each and every word. You know, a traditional practitioner, this is a big deal. You know, in day-to-day -day activities in exports, you know. So you pointed out, you know, where one of the occasions are. So I'll leave them to you, uh, Brendan, maybe to, to give some hints into this and help. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I missed the, the last part of that. Sorry. It's uh, pre clearance must be the golden outcome. Data ah. moves faster than ships. Stacks yeah. and yeah. rush must be beneficiaries. Yeah, yeah. The pre clearance. Pre yeah, yeah. pre clearance. So that, that's, yeah, so that's um, uh, one of kind of our real, real targets is, is getting that pre clearance. Um, and uh, if you're on a platform and or ecosystem that allows for pre-clearance because you can share the data faster, then obviously you've got the competitive advantage because your goods are cleared, the fresher they're in the country. Um, yeah, yeah. We know how this thing's impact, you know, demurrage, huge... Uh, costs for you know having goods lying in docks you know for yeah, uh, weeks and weeks expensive real estate of uh of sitting in containers the cost of uh, yeah, we, we think a sustainable business these things you know impact heavily on the whole picture so it's, it's good to point out how these solutions can impact these aspects as well in a positive way Uh, okay, so yeah, Bob, your yeah, pre-clearance must be a golden outcome. Yeah, absolutely. Data moves faster than ships. 
tax revenue is a big benefit of tax. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and when we talk on that, just on that, when we talk about the, the digital twin as well, the trade twin in uh, um, that really expensive kind of real estate with inside the ports, but if they've got if they've got that forward visibility of where the object, which is that 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 container one of that representing the the trade twin of the container, where that is, and what's the likelihood of that actually being uh, um, arriving at a certain time, or even the port being able to provide feedback information to that to that digital twin to say, no, I don't need you yet. There's there's no space for you. The the the, the there's the delays. The the ships late. The container ships late. So it it it, it plays both ways. Perfect. Is there any other question from the attendees today? Feel free to, to ask directly to Brandon. No other question. No questions. Perfect. If, if people want to reach out, my, my details are, are on the deck. Uh, please reach out. I'm really interested to hear what other yeah. people think. Perfect. Okay. Thank you so much, Brandon, for, for today's presentation. It was very insightful, very interesting. And I think we can call you, you know, meeting yeah. is over and hope to see you during the next event. Yeah. Thank you so much, Brendan, for joining us today. Thank Thanks, you. Everybody. Thank you, Andrea. Yeah. Thank you, Brendan. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Bye bye. You. See you. Bye. Take care. Take care. Bye. And definitely improved our future self this time. <laughs> <laughs> All good. Thank you. We'll do.